1974. The same night you came and Lenny came for the first time, I believe. And from that day on, the second meeting we, the three of us were at, which was May, was an election meeting. And it was the first time I'd ever been to a meeting where women contested the elections against each other. Mm -hmm. I found that so incredible that women weren't saying, oh, if you really want me to be chair, I'll do it. Right. They were saying, I want to be, you know, I want to be treasurer, I want to be secretary, I want to be treasurer, um, yeah. whatever. And I, this is the job that I want to do. And I was, and this is what I'm going to do. It was astounding to me. But the, the biggest single thing in, in Northern Virginia now, and then it spread out, and it, it permeated everything, was that people didn't we work together. Um, and, you know, when Georgia was skills. not a, a political activist, I was. And that but you were matter. a spiritual and religious activist. Yes. And, and so. And a fence climber. And a fence climber. <laughs> so what do I do? I end up, you know, doing all, all the printing for the. But we learn from religion. each other. And, but my, many, many organizations focus so much on their splits and, in, and where they disagree. And where they disagree, or you should do this. I think you really should do, you know, women do right. it, not electoral politics, and, and heaven's not, not being a bad woman, but, and we didn't do that. You did whatever you wanted to do, and it was okay with everybody else. Well, it was, oh, in many, most cases, it was more than okay, it was valued. Yes, it, yes, yes. It was, it yes. was truly yes. valued. I mean, one of the things I learned in our walk to Richmond was, number one, I was not quite as macho as I thought I was. <laughs> You know, especially after I started getting a bunch of blisters and my knee got wrenched. And I, I was really well, well aware that my life was in the hands of Pat and Mary. And and I felt and Junior in the band. And Junior in the band. But but it's Pat and Mary that are here. I you know, that's why I mention it. And and I felt secure in that. And one of the things that I learned from that is for every one person you have on the line, you need 10 in support. And I, I've carried that into the work that I've done with religious women trying to make changes in, in their institutions. And, uh, and it's, it's valued. And one of the things that I learned was that we were unique in that the people that did the direct action didn't think themselves superior from anybody else. Um, you know, if Pat called me up and said, this is the last get out the vote push, we need you on Tuesday night, I was there. And if I called Pat up and said, uh, we need some legal observers for an action we're doing, Pat was there. And it was all, it was all valuable and it was all important. And I think that's an important message to get across for people that want to do change. And the reality is no single approach is going to win it for you. You have to have multiple approaches, and you have to respect each other. And you have to be redundant. That That's true. Well, what was it? That, and the redundancy is incredibly important. If someone becomes ill with those critical roles, you have to have someone else who can slide right into it. It was interesting, too, because I did legal referral, and people could call me who were getting a divorce, women find out if there were lawyers that were specifically interested in seeing that women got their fair share of, a, of settlement in a divorce. And I maintained a list of lawyers, not anything the lawyers gave me on t uh, publicly, because they can't do that. And I, owned, I had a couple lawyers who were on the list, recommended by other lawyers, and they wanted to come off the list. They didn't want anything to do with us. But generally, lawyers were, most lawyers that women lawyers in particular were interested in taking care of women legally and being, well, I did a lot of referrals. And you did a, that service that you did for us was just remarkable because it wasn't just lawyers. By the end, you had the contacts that we needed over and over and over again. Well, she was like an encyclopedia. Well, it was all down on me. Well, my phone, I mean, I was at the, on the phone half the day with, with uh, telephone calls on Pacific Flyer. Right. You gave, but you gave all of us resources. Well, that's what, I, that's what we needed. Yeah. But it was invaluable. It really was. My son had sibling rivalry with my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and my cat knew how to treat 
jump up on the telephone table and hit the button on the phone that would turn it off. And when, when I had not paid attention to him and not fed him at the right time, he would leap up and turn the phone. He didn't turn you in for abuse, did he? He should have. <laughs> Yeah, her cat was civilized. My cat simply knocked the phone out of my hand to the floor and snarled at me. <laughs> Here we go with the cat stories. Jean is loving this. I want to, I want to go back to something Mar Marianne said about redundancy. And, and it picks up, Marianne Fowler, on what you said uh, at the, this afternoon's uh, memorial for Jean, that when you two were arrested, the opposition was astounded that we kept going, that we didn't, because just like you said, they thought that if they arrested you and Jean, they would cut off the other head of the movement and we disappear. And <laughs> were they wrong? <laughs> you know, Pat kept put, kept we putting needed them to be arrested. The ERA Times, nobody left, you know, and, and that was redundancy. And, and what they didn't realize is, they would have had to arrest 10 or 15 of us to stop because we could fill in for each other. And not as would. well. Nobody could do it as well as you, Mary Ann. Well, but we could have, I mean, you know, uh, picked we, it up. We, we had a lot of depth, mm -hmm. a lo whole lot of depth. And don't forget, there was a, a whole group of women back in Alexandria yeah, who would actually have been part of that, and then who would actually run that campaign. That if there had been more women in Richmond that had disappeared, then we were prepared to step in. And we had waves. I still, I still I don't think we did. I mean, 3,000 years of patriarchy. <laughs> you need more than one generation of waves, yeah. which is why we're taping this for the next generation. What is the calendar of the year? Absolutely. And the tapes here. That's already a little bit late, but I have a lot of the uh, business. Yes. Business. I think one of the issues today is we're not getting much of the the word out to the uh, teenage young women and 20 year olds and so on. And uh, I know I've offered before to do the television, I work with AAUW on television, and I've offered to do a show for anybody that wants to go on and talk about it, and I haven't had a taker. <laughs> you might very soon, because I, I, I love Fairfax um, County Public Access. I think that's Ch a really, Chan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a real, I've done shows with them before, and um, yeah, I think they're wonderful, so. Well, uh, you know, let's, let's definitely uh, talk I'll about give that. you. My email or, or, or my producer's email because oh, uh, yeah. there are all kinds of different formats that we could do or areas we could talk about. Yeah. We could do several shows. I mean, the, the <coughs> concept is open. There's not just one one way to do it. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're open to uh, suggestions, but I think we need, <coughs> pardon me, I'm very interested in getting the word out to as many people as possible about where the movement has been and where it needs to go. Great, great. And you on email. I think it will be wonderful. <laughs> One of the things that I think that we did, which was incredibly brave, and I think of you, Pat, because was the work that we did against violence against women with uh, Jane McFay setting up the Rape Companion Program, which, and so that we had women going out with the police yeah. in the squad car. And the other thing was then domestic violence. The year that I was elected president of the chapter, uh, my phone number and home address went into the phone book as, as Northern Virginia Now. And suddenly the calls began coming in constantly. We had over 400 women calling for help. And at that time, there was only one place in Northern Virginia that would take a battered woman, and that was Christ House in Alexandria, and they would not take children. Now, what woman who is being battered is trying to leave her children behind? I mean, that's absurd. And uh, so we began a double-blind shelter system because we didn't have anything else. So I, I would be a central point and get, because my phone number was available, and then I would call other women. And they would come and get the woman, and I wouldn't know where she was. So if I got a guy with a shotgun on my front porch looking for his wife, really angry, I didn't know where she was. Well, no, but the, but the people working on it were not known, but I remember one time I went to a victim's house. The husband was disobeying a, a, an order against him for a violation of his wife. And the point was he was beating on her, and I was to go over and get her to take her to the courthouse to file a the fact that the restraining order was not being maintained. And as I went to her front door, parked in front of the house near McLean and the Beltway, 
uh, I looked and his mother was coming down the stairs with like a, I don't know, it was a stick or a pipe or what in her hand. And uh, I said to her, we need to leave now. She wanted to pick up some crap and put in the car. You know, they never want to get in the car and go. They have stuff to take. And I said, no, we need to get in the car now because this woman was coming down the stairs. And she did. I mean, she, I made it pretty clear what I wanted to do. And I'd seen a big thing in the sky when I was there, but I didn't know what it was. And I didn't care because I just needed to be concerned with her. And we get to the courthouse. And I'm not doing anything, but she's talking to the magistrate about the restraining order that had been violated and, and the complaint against it. And there's a policeman next, because it was mid, 11.30 or midnight, so this is where the cops go at night when they have nothing else to do with the magistrate's office. And there's a walkie-talkie on, and it's on, and it's talking about an airplane collision, but they didn't know where it is. And I said, oh, I know where it is. I just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him where it was, because that's what I had seen, and it was an airplane collision. Wow. You know, but, small planes. But, you know, we also had situations where the law in Virginia needed to be changed because when we started out, what we didn't realize was that the police could not arrest on probable cause under Virginia law at that time. And so we they would have to see him. the violence. Yeah. They would have to see the violence to engage. And so... You mean they couldn't arrest you because it was a complaining witness? Yep. And, and so... So the, we realized that we had some allies within the system, but also people who were genuinely really opposed and sometimes very, very awful. I can remember uh, you, Pat, telling us about going into court with Noelle Sherman. And Noelle, who had been beaten around the head to the point of her hearing was affected and so on. By her and husband? By her husband. And uh, the judge leaning over the bench while she was testifying and he said to her, did you deserve it, honey? Mm -hmm. And that was a moment. Oh, we, we, that was a moment for us. Well, we did court observers. Yes, we that's what I wanted to do. We would go into the courtroom, and I can remember hearing some of those remarks. I would always sit in the front row when I was doing it with an open notebook. And occasionally a judge, a stupid judge, who saw me sitting there, would make some really asinine remark, and I'd put quotes around it and his name, and we'd publish it and move it all around. Uh, somebody high up in the court said to me one day, Mary, I want you to know that you have had a profound, meaning all of them, have had a profound effect on how this court operates. The, the administration of the court was glad for what we did, but they had no way to implement that thing by themselves. We went in as foreigners to the court process that we could do it. And along with that, we had some allies in the because I will never forget going into Jed Stout's office, uh, who kept all the data for the Fairfax County Police, and saying to him, uh, you know, I've got to do something about domestic violence. I want to know your opinion about it. And Jed looked up to me, and he said, assault is assault is assault is assault. And I thought, okay, this is an opening. <laughs> and uh, it turned out, when they got the stats out, that there were more officers injured or killed going into domestic disturbances than going into armed robberies in progress. Yeah. No one had cataloged that at that point, but Jed was the one who pulled those stats out. And uh, it was pretty amazing because I, at that time, was on the LAA Council, uh, which granted federal money to uh, criminal justice projects. And so Cornelia Suler and a number of women got together and wrote a grant that started the program that we had uh, to that was adopted then by the county after it went through its grant funding, which worked with battered women and then the Women's Commission picked it up and we got a shelter and all of this. But it, it really all started from these few points. And it was the police who said to us, it was the guys on the front line who said, we want the evidentiary laws changed. We see the violence. We know what's going the on. The police often require and ask the citizens to go to the supervisors or whatever responsible for the law and work on it. I had that same experience in a park, a Fairfax County public park situation where the police officer walked me back to the house after the incident and said, because I was talking in long sentences to him, and he said, do you 
know some of these politicians. Can you do anything? And the next thing I did was call my supervisor, explain the situation. And the police officer told me, I won't tell you who I am, but I will tell you one of the top three people in the department. But he would not say which one, who he was. And I talked to a supervisor at the end of the week after the day had a meeting, and I said, anything happened there about a park situation? And he said, oh, so-and-so came in all steamed up and said, I want to put this on the top of the agenda, and we voted on it before 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> But what we found, it just needed somebody to bring it up. But we found allies who helped us in, on unfamiliar ground. Because I would not, with, if I had not met Jed Stout, he would never have complained to me about the evidentiary laws. And that, you know, it was that communication and the working with people who were feminist, whether they were male or female, oh, yeah. who were willing within the system to assist us and inform us and uh, encourage us to do what we, well, we do. could do what they couldn't do they they knew what had to be done but through their because of where they were they couldn't do it right exactly and it that was an amazing experience it was for me was very I think I think there were a couple of other things that went on I didn't do anything in the legislative and, and lobbying side um, that's because Marianne Fowler got me bitten with the political bug <laughs> Marianne it's all your fault I've, I've done 25 campaigns since you knew me. <laughs> that, this is called the conversion uh, experience. Uh, and, 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 and you don't know it, but you have, you have members of parliament in Ottawa that owe, there are two of them for an absolute sure who owe their entire political career to you. <laughs> we should probably mention that Pat's actually a Canadian yes. citizen, which is one reason why she was never arrested with us. Okay. All I could do was peacekeep because so she, 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 would have she exported Marianne Fowler's uh, yeah. brand of politics, you know, yeah. projects to Canada. Thunder East Beer I North and York Southwest. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but I start. I, oh, where was I going with the? With the you said you had never um, done kind of lobbying yeah. legislative work. The I think the lobbying was tremendously successful because I think we had an immense amount of credibility. And this isn't my story, but my, my recollection was being told that after Fairfax County passed its, basically, uh, its affirmative action law, whatever that was <coughs> called, um, they, the feminists did a little bit of analysis and looked at it and said, there's not gonna be a white man promoted ever for, for the next, five years or seven years, this is ridiculous. And so we went into the, the Board of Supervisors and said so, that, that you know, this is not the way you go. This is, they were, they were going for strict quotas and, and, it, and that kind of reasoning and reason, I think went a huge, took a huge part in the credibility of the organizations. Uh, you know, all of the women's organizations, because they, if they went in and said something, they had been fair on, on, a, on another issue and more than fair, mm -hmm. so that when they went in and, and talked, people li people had a tendency to listen a lot more. Um, and I, I again, I think that was coming out of a lot of things. I think starting in '75, I I saw the political side because that's my love and, and that's that was my interest of trying to work a piece of Alexandria and succeeding in those was it seven or eight precincts? And then realizing, hey, we could do it, and we could expand it. But also, what did the people in Alexandria do? They were not happy with Jim Thompson. And so they went into, to say the least, and they went into the Democratic primary and said, we will find a candidate that's good, and we'll run him against Jim Thompson and Mr. Mann, I believe his name was. Frank Mann, who wasn't, you know, totally wonderful either, but I think he wasn't quite as awful. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. For posterity, oh, anything. <laughs> <laughs>